Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Robin Archer. I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband program here at the London School of Economics. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our event tonight about the future of social democracy. Tonight's event is jointly sponsored by the Ralph Miliband program and also by the Department of Sociology, um, which has a long tradition, actually, of considering central questions in political sociology like the one we'll be talking about tonight. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, a, a very eminent scholar, an eminent scholar of democracy in general and of social democracy in particular, Professor Adam Jaworski. Adam is the Carol and Milton Petrie Professor at New York University um, and he, he graduated in sociology from Warsaw University, went on to Northwestern in Chicago to do a PhD and then spent, I think, more than 20 years at the University of Chicago as a teacher before taking up his current um, point, his current affiliation to, to NYU. He's had visiting posts in lots of different countries, I, you know, India, Chile, France, Britain, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, I think, I probably, I probably missed a few. Uh, in any case, he, he's, he's got a, an incredible uh, international reach and reputation. And during the 1980s and into the early 1990s, he was part of a small but I, I think sort of very fecund and um, group of people that went by the banner analytical Marxism. And some of you may know uh, some of these works, which I think had a, a powerful uh, impact in the social sciences. Well, he's won all sorts of prizes. I mean, it's even worse than dealing with the countries that you've been in, but I, they include the Gregory Lubert Award for Comparative Politics, the Woodrow Wilson Prize, the Johan Skite Prize from Sweden, the Skapik Sabanchi Prize from Turkey, the Juan Lintz Prize from the International Political Studies Association, the Socialist Review <coughs> Book Prize, and he's been appointed to all sorts of um, scholarly organisations, not least um, as, a member of the, as a fellow of the British Academy. Well, uh, Adams made a major contribution to a number of areas of scholarship. He's made contributions to comparative methods, to basic questions of political economy concerning the relation between states and markets, very important contributions to classic issues about democratisation and their relationship to economic development. And most recently, I think he's made some powerful um, contributions to the debates that are taking place about democratic backsliding. He's got two books out just in the last few years about that. But without doubt, one of the most enduring themes in his work over a period of at least 40 years has been concerned with the prospects for social democracy. And I think it's um, safe to say that from his classic work on uh, capitalism and social democracy and the related work in Paper Stones from that period onwards, his way of thinking about it has had a powerful shaping effect on the debate as a whole. So tonight, we've asked Professor Zhivorsky to come and return to that theme and give us some of his current thinking about some of the dilemmas that face the social democratic tradition. We've asked him to think what the new opportunities are for that tradition as well as the new constraints. Well, Adam's going to speak, I think, for about 45 minutes and then we're going to have time for question and discussion. I should just point out we've got an online audience as well, which you, you can't all see, so I'll have to sort of juggle between questions from you guys and the online audience. If you are part of the online audience, the way to ask your question is to put it into the Q&A on the, on, the, um, on the relevant website. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it, it'll be fed through and we, can, we won't be able to take all the questions, we'll be able to take some of them. But first, before we do any of that, can I ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Adam Jaworski. No. 
<laughs> yes. Well, I am particularly honored to be here uh, because I've always read and very much respected Ralph Milliban, whom I had a privilege of meeting once, had a long conversation with him, which remains sufficiently vivid in my memory that I remember what we talked about. And what we talked about was, yes, the future of social democracy. That was 40 years ago. Now, speaking about the future is always difficult for somebody like myself who considered oneself a social scientist. I always uh, remember an adage coined by a late economist, Ken Bolding, who said, uh, the only function of economic predictions is to legitimize astrology minerals. So one always does it with trepidation. But I actually have, 40 years ago, written things which had predictions about the fate of social democracy. So I have credentials, and I have to face these credentials. What are they? I got. I started thinking systematically about social democracy, having lived through the debacle of the peaceful road to socialism, an experiment of the Allende government in Chile between 1970 and 73. After that tragedy, as many people around the world, particularly the Italian Communist Party, I started asking myself, so what are the possibilities and what are the limits of transformations of capitalism that can be effectuated by social democrats? And I was particularly, I mean, the, the way I thought about this, um, and I have to tell you, I have sort of a little bit of a game theoretic strategic streak in my veins, was I was asking myself, so did social democrats do whatever it was possible to do, or did they commit errors? And the question of error was very prominent in the agenda. And by errors, obviously, I mean something like this. One can commit errors only if there are some choices. Some are better than others, and one does not do whatever is best for the realization of one's goals. So just the very notion of errors means or entails the notion that there are some strategic choices. I wrote three things just... Uh, Something got in there. Uh, I wrote, oh, this was supposed to be quotation marks. They didn't come out, these 11s that you <laughs> see in there. Uh, I wrote first an article in New Left Review of the Book, uh, a New Left Review, which came out in 1980. Then I developed the argument in that essay in a book, so, uh, Capitalism and Social Democracy, where this was published in 1985, and together with Michael Wallerstein, with whom I co-author one of the chapters, we worried very much about the danger presented by neoliberalism. And then in 1986, I published a book which was much more with John Sprague, which was narrowly focused on the electoral future, actually, of social democracy. So I thought that social democrats faced three consecutive choices, each of which was intensely debated at the time. The first one was whether to get engaged in electoral politics or try to bring in socialism by other means they were called direct action, but basically by insurrectionary. 
The second choice, once social democrats did enter into electoral politics, was whether to remain as a pure class party that is appeal narrowly to what socialists consider to be the working class, or to try to extend appeal to other groups, classes, and strata. And the third one, which is actually not a single choice, but a whole long series of choices, was how to administer capitalist societies when they govern them. I think the answers were the following. The first answer was, emerged in the 1880s, 1890s, that the only way that socialists could possibly come to power and realize their ultimate goals, because they had ultimate goals, which was to abolish classes, abolish exploitation, and provide conditions for full development of each individual. The only way that socialists could conquer power would be by electoral means. Yes, 1890s, I think the Engels essay is 1891 or 1895 maybe, was the period when on the one hand a cannon, artillery, military strategy was developed, which means that barricades could not withhold them. And on the other hand, the Social Democratic Party was legalized in Germany in 1881, so workers gained votes. And this is why Engels, in 1885, I remember, says, so now instead of throwing cobblestones, we can throw voting ballots, yes, Votes became paper stones. <clears throat> Socialists could not have won elections by votes of workers alone. As you all know, the <coughs> original Marxist theory said that in the course of development of capitalism, inevitably, everybody, almost everybody, will become proletarians, some already are, some are not yet, they don't know that they will become proletarians, but peasants, petite bourgeoisie, they will all be proletarianism, proletarianized, they become wage workers, and as proletarians, they will vote for socialism. But already in the 1890s, Edward Bernstein, one of the prominent German social democrats, started to worry that maybe that structural prediction was false, that workers would not become a majority, that socialists could not win elections by the vote of workers alone, and therefore they have to extend their electoral appeals. And the third answer was that Revolution, and by this, socialists meant abolishing classes, abolishing exploitation, etc., can be achieved by a series of successive irreversible reforms that implemented under democratic conditions. This was the great invention of, to some extent, Burstein, Jean Jaurès in France, but many, many others. Um, and it was because it meant that there was no conflict between the next electoral campaign and realization of the ultimate goals. The idea was, <laughs> we're going to campaign on immediate reforms, open air, equalizing the justice system from Jaurès, uh, extending, uh, making free public education, another French socialist, 1902, 
item on the program. So we're going to campaign on those grounds. We're going to win elections on that issue. And if we win the next, if we win the next election, we're going to implement another reform. If we lose an election, nothing very bad is going to happen because these, reverse, these reforms are irreversible, would be irreversible, the right, the bourgeois parties which come to power would not reverse them, so then the next time we win, we're going to make the next step. So these were more or less, this was my framework, and there were some predictions attached to this framework. What makes me chagrined is to see that the pessimistic predictions to which I have arrived at that time about the limits to which social democrats can transform capitalism, I think, have materialized. Uh, I'm not claiming clairvoyance. I will point out to some mistakes I made some ways in which I thought I thought incorrectly. Uh, but all of my life, as probably some or many of you, I've been driven by this Gramsci's uh, precept of uh, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. And I have to say that uh, uh, sometime the intellect overrides the will, so I'm just preparing you that uh, <laughs> this is not going to be an inspiring talk. I'm going to talk on four topics after I open the wine uh, bottle. I'm going to say something about electoral prospects of social democracy about policy aspects. I'm going to ask what went wrong and where are we now. Electoral. I'm just showing you, you probably have seen tens of versions of the same graph. <clears throat> this is the time pass of every share of socialist votes in Europe from socialist, social democratic, labor, whatever. Uh, the parties call themselves in Europe from uh, 1960 to almost today. And a secular decline, particularly sort of in the 1990s, is visible. Different people classify parties somewhat differently, so one picture may, never, may not look exactly the same as another, but the general trend is unquestionable. There's an enormous amount of research on this topic, as you know, there are probably, well, um, the research asks, what explains the trend, which is impossible to answer because there's so many transformations that took place in the same time that sorting out what is the cause, I think it's next to impossible, it's impossible. What explains differences among countries? Why is it that? Uh, at least until recently, the PESO, the Spanish Socialist Party, does well, and the PSF, the French Socialist Party, dismally. Yes, so we try, we have research on this topic. And there is an enormous amount of research on individual voting behavior. I, preparing for this talk, I just read an article by Bando um, who summarizes results of 51 empirical studies of social democratic voting that were published just in the decade between 2010 and 2020. Um, this is the biggest, uh, I think, research field in political science. As a matter of fact, uh, when I meet some people for the first time and they learn that I'm a political scientist, the first thing they ask me is who's going to win the next election. Just <laughs> everybody thinks that that's all we do, on which my record is dismal. So, um, so what Van Dow finds, he has 10 hypotheses. I'm sorry, but every time you see these exclamation marks, I'm sorry, 11, they're supposed to be quotation marks. Somehow it 
got there. Um, so he, find, he has uh, 10 hypotheses and finds support, some support for all of them by one. And I think that this pretty much reflects the field. What this field produces is the results to show that everything matters a little bit and nothing matters very much. So in the end, I don't think it's very instructive. What do we learn from voting studies? This is going to be a little bit technical, the only somewhat technical part of what I'm going to say. Yes. We vote that voters who have some policy preferences, uh, which depend on some observable traits, such as being a manual worker in an industry, male manual worker of industry of the age of 50, yes? Uh, vo voters with some ideal points about policies vote in a particular way given the positions of the parties, given party platforms, party promises, party slogans, and everything else. They take party positions as fixed, these studies. They take preferences of voters as independent of party positions, as given. And then they calculate probabilities, such as the probability that a worker male of a certain age is going to vote for a social democratic party, given positions of all parties, platforms of all parties, and maybe some sociological factors, loyalty, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an example. Yeah. So this is from Financial Times very recently. Think of a voter who has idea points exactly at zero points, where the axis intersect, yes? So this voter, in 2010, he'd be closer to the Conservative Party than to the Labour Party. So this voter is going to be likely to vote conservative. But party positions change between 2010 and 2022, according to Financial Times. And now note, this voter is closer to Labour Party than he is or she is to the Conservative Party. So now she's more likely to vote Labour. Yes, that's what studies of voter voting do. Now, why is that not very informative? The first, I think, is the axiom of electoral politics is that you can't win votes somewhere without losing some votes elsewhere. There are trade-offs. And to illustrate this, I'm going to return to Sprague and I did in uh, paper stones because it opens up the issues that I want to discuss. When socialist parties decided to go for votes of non-workers, they diluted the salience of classes as a determinant of political behavior among workers. So as they were gaining votes in other groups, they were losing appeal to workers. And if you think in that way, then you think that there is a, a caring capacity for the party, namely, there is some level which the party can reach and perhaps remain there, but which it cannot surpass. So here is to amuse you. Uh, here are our predictions as to what is the maximum share of socialist parties, social democratic parties, in the first column, based on the 1970 class structure. That is, if the class structure were frozen in 1970, we would have expected in the long run, this is, would be the share of social democratic parties in these particular countries. And this is the result of the last parliamentary election. As you see, in the first three countries we had spectacular success in <laughs> predicting. And in the last three countries, we had a spectacular failure in predicting. 
The difference between the, these, two, uh, uh, these two groups of countries, the first three and the next three, is unions. Yes. Unions were very strong, in particularly in Norway and Sweden. And when unions were strong, this trade of, between votes of non-workers and votes of workers was much more clement for the socialists. And I think what happened in the meantime is that unions were eroded, and this is why we overpredicted by so much the socialist shares in the, the countries which had strong unions, while we did uncannily well in countries where unions didn't have the same identification power. There are two aspects of what we did that are wrong. One is that yes, this trade of we portrayed was in one dimension. It was sort of you know, left, right, or workers, less workers, uh, workers, bourgeoisie, petite bourgeoisie, peasant bourgeoisie. And the second one is that we assumed in there that the appeals of the right-wing parties, of the bourgeois parties, would remain the same, that they would not change in response to the appeals of the socialists. These were obviously mistakes. Already Lipset and then Herbert Kitchell uh, observed that maybe political space is two-dimensional, namely there is the economic dimension, but there is also Lipset thought political dimension and Kitchell thought, which is between liberals and authoritarians. So Lipset had a category of working class authoritarians where he would put communists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the argument was the political space is two-dimensional. Today, I think there's all kinds of evidence that the political space is multi-dimensional. Uh, European party systems became fragmented. The number of what we political scientists call effective parties, effective parties is the inverse of the sum of squares of party shares, increased from three in 1960 to four in 2015. So as you see by a third, more parties on the left, more parties on the right, and the trade-offs are just innumerable. Yes, they are about income distribution, about immigration, nationalization, racism, all kinds of you know, abortion, uh, marriage for everybody. And now, as you probably have followed in Spain, big controversy about whether uh, people under age 16, I think, can change sex, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, they divided socialists from their allies, from Podemos, uh, the number of cleavages today is just, I think, much greater, and they really fractionalize the political space. Now, what would happen, under what conditions could we actually get some results? If you sort of think of when could we make predictions? Only in something that we would call equilibrium, which has two parts. Given party positions, voters who have particular preferences vote for the parties which are closest to their preferences. But given voter preferences and given positions to other parties, each party takes positions trying to maximize its vote share or its probability of becoming a member of a government, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? That would be a full electoral equilibrium. This is static, I'm not going to go into it, but the point is we have no way of telling what would happen, which equilibrium would prevail. It turns out there's lots and lots of possible solutions, and we have no instruments to tell which. When more than two parties compete in more than one dimensional space, we have no unique solution. So we just can't even speculate about the electoral future of social democracy. I think we have no instrument to do that today. I think probably 
Some socialist parties are going to do better, they'll recover. Some are going to do worse. But what is the trend and which ones will be better off and which ones will be fail? We just can't tell. So I can't say anything about the electoral future of socialist parties. Does it matter? Well, I think it does. Um, I like the paper, again, which I just read recently, which is, again, a review of literature on uh, the effects of social democracy on mainly income inequality. I like this paper both for the review of literature as for some new results. The topic is... Uh, an old one, there are hundreds of studies of effects of social democratic rule. Uh, I think the first one, the classic was, was by Douglas Hibbs in 1977. And pretty much everybody finds that, yes, social democrats, uh, socialists, even democratic party in the US reduces income inequality with one exception, Clinton. The interesting, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but this is not my mistake. It's somehow in this transliteration, the I's between F and I disappeared. There should have been pre-FISC in here, but it seems to be systematic. So the interesting result is that it seems that these results are persistent. That is, that countries which are already more equal redistribute more, and parties which are already unequal redistribute less. So there are basically, I found something like this myself, show you a picture. So this is inequality of market of pre-taxes and transfers gross income, and this is redistribution, share of national product that is being redistributed as a function of the inequality. As you see, in very equal countries, little is redistributed because there's little to redistribute. But what's striking in here is that in very unequal countries, very little is redistributed. What this suggests is, uh, there's a very nice article by Holland Ben Abu, is that basically we sort of have two equilibria. One is high taxes, High redistribution, another one, okay. so, equality, high taxes, high redistribution, another one is inequality, low taxes, low redistribution. And that implies that the effects of social democracy are long lasting, that they are entrenched. How does it happen? I think one explanation is just inertia, if you wish. Reducing social expenditures is just extraordinarily difficult. Once social democrats come to office, expand social services, expand taxes and transfer, reducing redistribution is very difficult. There's only one democratic leader of whom I know of uh, who reduced the budgetary expenses and social policies in absolute terms. Thatcher didn't. Reagan did it, didn't. Clinton did. So one mechanism is just a resistance yes, of the voters against any reduction of uh, social expenditures. And another one is uh, political inequality. This is a topic in itself on which I could dwell. But money has all kinds of ways of infiltrating itself into politics. Um, and it's easy, okay, it's easy to show. Just think of it. If you make a mild assumption that 
Political influence increases in income or increases in wealth. That assumption, even if the increase is not very large, because poor people don't vote, because rich people lobby, because rich people corrupt governments, innumerable ways in which money gets into politics. Once that happens, then this pattern that I just showed to you, let me return to it, this becomes possible. So, if political inequality increases, sorry, if economic inequality increases political inequality, political inequality is used for what? To increase economic inequality. Then we have this vicious circle, and we have the two equilibria, inequality, no redistribution, equality with redistribution. So, There are all kinds of attempts in all countries, international attempts, European, worldwide, everything, to, to regulating the access of money to politics. But they're not very effective for one reason is that, so why would those political institutions that regulate access of money to politics be less influenced by money than other political institutions? If you're a political economist, you think, these attempts are not going to be very fruitful. What I think does matter is uh, what Evers and Soskitcher called power resources. That's why unions really mattered. Yes? Because unions had financial strengths, organizational strengths, ideological resources. They could play politics on almost equal grounds with the bourgeoisie. When unions eroded, I think income inequality increased. My conclusion is obviously it does matter. It matters because the effects of reforms are long lasting. I focus only on income distribution, but you know there are many other policies with which social democrats were very successful. Not only social democrats, I don't want to say that. Yes. Welfare state in Italy and in Denmark were built by Christian democratic parties. But those reforms are long lasting. There are several protection of income, job training programs, social policies. The list is long, so I think it does matter. What went wrong? Well, I think that any kind of language of ultimate goals, any transformative vision of a common future, basically, socialists went, as I wrote recently, from revolution to reformism, which was a perhaps self-delusion, but it's certainly a reasonable strategy to coping with problems as they appear. One aspect of social democratic history that really strikes me as I look at it is that the list of problems that needed to be solved as provided by Jean Jaurès in 1902 is not any shorter than the list of problems that need to be solved today by social democrats. As some problems perhaps were solved and some neglected, so many new problems appeared that in a way, I think social democrats would transform themselves from dreamers about some long-term future to firefighters. Basically, yes, we don't get from 
social democrats these days anything longer than a program for the next election. We get no vision. And I return to this topic several times. Practically, again, this picture may look differently. Different people draw it somewhat differently. It ends early, and perhaps it's going up in here. But this is ideological distance between center-right and center-left parties as measured by party manifestos. As you see, that difference has dwindled from the end of 1970s. The right went right, neoliberal right, and the left and social democrats went even further to move by more of a distance to the right than the right. So the result is that the programmatic difference has really declined. What are the consequences? I'm obviously speculating or commenting. But this study I like very much. This is a study which asks people whether there are tensions in your country between poor and rich, managers and workers, old and young, and then different racial groups. This is in 10 or 15 European countries about five years ago. Now, some people say there are no tensions, and some people say there are tensions. Most say there are tensions. And when they say there are tensions, guess in which dimension they find tensions. Uh, Marxists, uh, communists would find between poor and rich, perhaps managers and workers, more technically. Uh, some people would find between young and uh, an old races would find among racial groups. The answer is that when people say that they're tensions, they say they're tensions in all dimensions. They just don't know. I mean, that really strikes me that there is no single yes. In the 1960s, you would ask this question, and people would say, yeah, they're you know, trust conflict. That's the tension. You would expect at least that if racism or xenophobia, or whatever you want to call it, uh, is the dominant ideology, you would expect people to say, yeah, it's you know, these foreigners, or these people with dark skins. Et no, people don't know. They don't kind of blame everybody because they don't know who to blame. Um, I've been reading surveys in which people ask, what do you think determines your chances in life? Your parents' wealth, your, your education, working hard, having connections. Do you know what is the most frequent answer? I don't know. None? Not this, not this, not this? I don't know. This is the one that really puzzles me. So if you ask people in Europe, uh, about the salience of left-right dimension. In different countries, 60 and 80% of respondents says, say uh, the left-right dimension is no longer relevant. And 90% of the respondents can locate themselves on the left-right scale. So this is kind of, again, bewildering. Yes, you say, no, no, this dimension it's not what organizes society, but I know where I stand on it. And finally, something I find really dramatic. So 60% of respondents in the US and 64% that should be in Europe believe that their children will be worse off financially than they are. So think of it this way. Since the Industrial Revolution, 200 years, eight generations, we have believed in every generation that our children will live better than we do. That's progress. Yes. The ideology of progress was what drove 
societies, drove individual aspirations, certainly drove parent aspirations. And now, people fear for the fate of their children. Moreover, these are surveys, but in the US there are very specific data which show that it's true. In 1960, 90% of 30 year olds were better off financially than their parents at 30. 90% in 1960. Today it's 50%. So, I titled this <laughs> slight ideological dis disorientation. I think <laughs> socialists stop speaking and so people become ideologically disoriented. There is no coherent project, but there's no coherent explanation. There's no, no coherent map of what the, our common future would look like. Now, this is a, a question which is recurrent. This is, were the constraints inexorable or the social democrats kind of give up and wish. Um, I was very much struck. I wrote a little essay um, on the exchange of letters in one meeting between uh, Willy Brandt, uh, Otto Kreisky, and uh, Olaf Palme which starts in the early 1970s. They begin to discuss uh, what is the situation of social democracy, where should we go? And then, in the middle of this conversation, they get hit by the first oil crisis, and then comes the second oil crisis. And suddenly, they discover that they cannot continue the way they did, just because of financial constraints, yes, galloping inflation, massive unemployment, 1970s, uh, that somehow the old social democratic policies, for some time at least, cannot, be, cannot continue. What they try to do desperately, something you know, to return to, what they try to do desperately is uh, try to find out some distinctively social democratic response to that crisis. The effort to reform must not cease, but these reforms now have to be different than they were before. I think some of the reforms did continue, but what really strikes me is just the change of language. Jean Jaurès. No, sorry, I'm always uh, confused. This is Leon Blum, says at one time, a better distribution would satisfy the requirements of justice as well as of development. Why does he say that? Because the quintessence of social democracy, social democracy was a developmentalist idea, was a developmentalist strategy. Yes? What was the idea, the basic idea? Burton Olin, the minister in the Swedish um, democratic government in 1936, says at one time, uh, Investment in healthy workers, well-educated and well-housed, is not a consumption expenditure. It's an investment. Investment in the most important resource we have for, quote, the people itself. Yes, that was the social democratic idea. The social democratic idea was that equality is good for growth. That, so if you wish, Justice and growth in this development come together. Well, as you know, that language has changed. With all kinds of third ways, we've found that there are dilemmas, so trade-offs, growth versus equality, uh, um, equality and efficiency. Uh, Everson, I think, has a 
trilemma, and Roderick has a trilemma, Tony Giddens had five dilemmas, of which none of was a dilemma in the logical sense. Somehow, social democrats said, no, 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 we can't do things. We're too constrained. Oh, here I have a quote, actually. That this is Bloom better distribution will revive production at the same time will satisfy justice. So, I have to accelerate a little bit. Look, <clears throat> I think so. The quintessence of the social democratic project today is that we're going to strengthen markets and counteract or mitigate its effect. But mitigation is not transformation. Mitigation is sort of an eternal task. You're going to strengthen markets, generate inequality that markets generate, and then start correcting for it. And I think this project just ran out of steam. There were all kinds of alternatives at various times. The alternatives failed. Uh, and it really kind of struck me, chagrined me, Here's somebody who I very much respect and follow and whatnot, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who writes a chapter in a book. The chapter is called The New Capitalist Order, and just read it. Yes, nothing new. Okay, the last and perhaps more painful part to prepare you. So I do have a privilege of having a teenage daughter who sometimes deems that it's okay to talk to me. And uh, I was thinking, well, let's look at the world through her eyes, not through mind. Uh, and when I do, what I see is a specter of a catastrophe. I'm not a climate specialist. I don't know the technical stuff about it. But I'll give you two facts. One is, so I live in New York um, in an apartment which is located seven blocks from East River. East River is, in fact, a misnomer. It's not a river. It's a branch of the sea that enters, surrounds the island of Manhattan. I live seven blocks, that's about a kilometer and 200 meters. According to predictions in 2050, my apartment is going to be located on the beach. It's going to be a block. The river is going to come to a block from where I live. So this is the future. But the future is now. Right now, as I'm talking to you, New York is enveloped by a cloud of smoke caused by the largest fires in the history of Quebec, which were related to, caused probably, by the hottest and the driest months of May in Quebec ever in history. My daughter and granddaughter are there. They are in the apartment with the windows closed, air conditioning off, can't leave. Schools are closed. So the future is now. We are back to the 1970s, but maybe on speed. Uh, it's the same kind of issues. The issue again is, so is there a left wing? Is there a social democratic response to the crisis? What will be the ingredients? Obviously, it has to be international, whatever program there is. Climate has no borders. Has to be directed by the state, perhaps with coercive measures, about which there will be disagreements along political lines. And the big issue is going to be distribution of costs. So you know, one left version is uh, that it's the rich who should pay. And at least Thomas Piketty says it's impossible to fight seriously against uh, a climate uh, warming uh, without a profound distribution of wealth in, within pay countries as well as the international scale. Now, 
Whether that's sufficient, I don't know. Whether it's politically feasible, I doubt. I think that this is again uh, kind of the old socialist problem which revisionism resolves so magically. Namely, long-term goals versus what the French call prix à la pompe, which is, means the uh, price of gasoline at the gas station. Yes. You don't call it gasoline, you call it nafta? Price at the pump. Okay, price at the pump. Yeah. Okay. I, I use the phrase because there's a brilliant observation by a French journalist saying that most people look at the price at the pump the same way as rich people look at stock market indices. For them, that's the indication of what's happening to their life. And this is the problem of socialists, which go, goes back to, to Palmer. Yes? Yes. Palmer says at one time, yeah, we have ultimate goals, but people want, it's not enough to say we have to modify the system. People care about the price of the pound. They care about their everyday life. They want their life to improve tomorrow, or at least not to deteriorate tomorrow, rather than reach some ultimate goals. The response that I, to what I can tell of social democrats to the climate change is to hide their head in the sand as deeply as they can. This is the Labour Party in the statement called, program called Five Missions. Mission number two is to make Britain a clean energy superpower to create jobs, cut bills, and boost energy. Radiant nationalistic future, yes? The French are even more inane. They have a program. This is the program of the French Socialist Party. So measure 32 to 47 out of 116 are devoted to the environment. And the title of the program is, it is time to live better. This is the time to live better. So this is, again, this question that probably ignores all of us, which is, uh, why are they doing it? Are they playing that upbeat line because they know the votes are not there? Probably the votes are not there. But are the votes not there because they're afraid to tell the truth? So this is the recurrent issue. As I kind of looked at back at my notes, I was writing these notes, I thought, there's a recurrent issue, which is, uh, Yes, to what extent the constraints to which social democrats were exposed were inexorable, and to what extent they were self-induced? There's no way to answer this question. The political animal in me, because there's still a little bit of a political animal in me, says uh, it's a question of courage. But I'm not very optimistic about that. We just really... The electoral constraint is very binding. And perhaps this is why maybe any kind of a vision of the future can come only from movements, from civil society, not from political parties. But that's about the only hope that I have. And with this, I will confirm to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a good chunk of time for questions and discussion. I'll start by taking um, some questions here. And if, um, when I call you, just wait till the microphone comes. And if you could say who you are and where you're from, because we do have a big podcast audience later and they can't see you and they would like to know. Um, so uh, the gentleman in the orange T-shirt. Uh, hi, I'm Diaz. I'm a final year student at LSC here. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I want to ask about the role of class in uh, the role of, of class, class, class and class consciousness. The, it, it's just do, to what degree do you think sort of class in the modern world has become another substitute for income inequality? And uh, what are the if you think that a class consciousness is something that we should keep in mind? To what degree do you think sort of electoral 
uh, system and policy should change accordingly. And there is a book by John P. McCormick of University of Chicago uh, called Machiavellian Democracy that sort of tries to use Niccolo Machiavelli's discourses and his praise of the ancient Rome and the patrician plebeian divide to sort of suggest improvements for the modern American political system in a way that we should sort of try to use class differences in the modern American society. So what do you think of that? Thank you very much. Are we going to get three at a time? Uh, why don't you answer that one and we'll see how we go. If we get lots of them, we might group them. Yeah. Look, I, there's class and there's money in your question. That's why I was hesitating. Uh, I, I think when we think class, we have to realize that that is a product of ideological conflicts among different groups. Yes? Um, it's not as some Marxists, but only very orthodox Marxists thought, a ready-made product. We say, Marx says in Communist Manifesto, the role of communists is to organize the proletariat as a class. As I study history of social democracy, what I see is a perennial conflict, first of Class ideology versus liberal individualistic ideology. Yes? Socialists say society is composed of classes. Uh, liberals say no, no, society is composed of individuals. And socialists win this battle among some groups and liberals win this battle among other groups. So to this extent, class is certainly a product. Who belongs to the working class? You know, that's, there are volumes on that top because socialists disagree about themselves. Trying to use a narrower or broader definition for electoral purposes, whatnot. So to some extent, obviously, you know, the real structure of economic and social structure of society is there, but the prevalence of class as a, something politically salient is an effect of conflict. Money is a topic apart on which I could speak for a long time. I, <laughs> money infiltrates politics. Yes. And it's sort of every dam is leaking. There is just, it seems, no way to completely eliminate it. I just read actually a comparison, an article comparing the influx of money into politics in Norway and the US. So in no way it seems to be much, much smaller, or at least the field is much more equal, mainly because of unions. Yes. But in the US, it's an oligarchy. Yes. In the US, sorry to say that, but bribing politicians is not a crime, it's not a legal offense. Anybody can give as much money to any candidate they want, yes, according to the Supreme Court. That's freedom of speech, by the way. And expecting favors. Not, not, not everybody who gives money expects favors. Some people give it in a disinterested way. Some people give it in purely ideological, because they're purely ideologically motivated. But a lot of it goes for favors. And this is why passing any kind of legislation that hurts really the interests of some sectors is impossible. Like, for example, regulating banks, regulating the financial sector, regulating the whole inv investment sector. It's almost impossible. Yes. So, I'm done. Right. Um, so, who else do we have? Um, let's just see who's interested. Yep. So, can I take? Uh, I will take two questions now. So, um, the woman in orange and then the person in green. Uh, hi, uh, Professor uh, Brodsky. I've been reading your book since 
10 years ago. <laughs> and I'm a really big fan of you. I'm a consultant, uh, but I used to study politics. And my question is, so recently we are entering this economic recession, especially you know, uh, in Western democracies and also lots of countries like China as well. So my question is, what is the impact of the economic recession in the next few years? Uh, what's the impact of this on first, Western democracies like Europe and the US, and second, on authoritarian regimes like China? Okay, so the impact of the recession on democracies and on authoritarian regimes, and the, the woman in green. Hello. I'm also a big fan of you. Um, my name is Veronica. I'm from Latin America. I'm a student here at Master's in Environment and Development. So I'm very interested in the link between climate change and democracy. And in a specific, my question is, how, do, how risky do you see that in the current situation that we have now, when the global governance of climate change is now able to push all countries to take action, it's like a prisoner's dilemma, and also big emitters of CO2 emissions are autocracies. And the global south has different demands as security and climate change is not the first priority. How do you see it in the future? Is possible that if these countries are autocracies turn into democracies, we have better chances to fight climate change? Can be that part of the solution or not? Thank you. Look, I'm not a public intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things I know and some things I don't know. So uh, I'm not <laughs> going to be able to answer all of your questions. I cannot predict the impact of recession on uh, democracy or social democracy. I, I can tell you. I think democracy is here to stay. Um, there are all these backsliding countries. I've studied them, as my, fact, my current research has a lot to do with them. That is, yes, there is a whole series of countries in which the governments use democratic means to usurp discretion in policy making and increase their chances to be reelected. Recently, you saw Turkey, yes. The incidence of this phenomenon is disputed. Uh, there is a Swedish public relations firm, sorry, they think they are a research institute, called Vidam, uh, which claims that democracy is falling all around the world. There are many other people, very nice article by Ann Meng and Andrew Little, claiming that it's not true. Uh, I think that the number of countries in which this kind of auto coup, auto golpe has occurred has increased. Different people calculate between 20 and 30, but I don't think that democracy in the world is uh, at stake or is in danger. The fact that parties we don't like win elections doesn't mean that democracy is at stake. I mean, the, the triumph of Mrs. Meloni in Italy is not an indication of weakening of democracy. So far, she's observing all the democratic rules. So I don't think that democracy is at stake. In part, I think, because we don't have alternative ideologies. You know, this is not 19... Some people make a comparison between the period now and the interwar period. The big difference is in the interwar period, we had two coherent, logically constructed, appealing ideologies, communism and fascism. Yes, these were really alternative blueprints of organizing society and politics, and they were extraordinarily appealing. Now we don't have it. We have it sort of an authoritarian instinct in some countries, but it's not more than instinct. It's just desperately trying to hold on to power, like in my native country, Poland, at the very moment. Okay. 
So I don't think democracy is in danger, that I can say. As for uh, the, you know, climate change, I am particularly embarrassed, I have to tell you, to speak about it in the presence of my wife, who spent a large part of her life in this kind of issues and negotiations. Uh, yes, uh, disagreement. All I can say, okay. So China, uh, let me say something about this. So China is able to introduce some policies which are painful and costly that the West has not been. China has made enormous programs in alternative sources of energy. But China is the largest pollution, polluter in the world per unit of output, not total. Yes. It has the dirtiest technology in the world today. So on the one hand, yes, it has some you know, positive examples to follow. But on the other hand, it is not an example to follow. Yes. OK. So um, let's just get another couple of uh, indications of who wants to speak. So we've got um, two people over here. Um, perhaps the check shirt, first of all. Um. Um, thank you for your speech, Mr. Przeworski. Um, my name is Alex, and I'm a third year student at the LSE. I want to hear about your take on the upcoming elections in Poland, considering the uh, dissection of the left-leaning political party, so that being the creation of the Hołownia movement, which is more pro-trade union, but the same as less progressive, which is dividing the left-leaning votes, and how it could kind of like uh, lead, pave the way for, first of all, uh, getting rid of the Law and Justice Party from the government, and second being the future of social democracy and democracy as a whole in Poland. Thank you. Okay, and we'll just take a second question. Uh, yeah, this person here. Hi, I'm Professor Tivosi. Uh, my question is, like, um, to what extent do you think elite influence is important? Not just... I mean, what influence? E elite influence. Elite. Like, we know, we know in democracies, through lobbying, through bribing, or or many other forms, but uh, we don't really study a lot on like quasi-authoritarian states or authoritarian states. Uh, quasi-authoritarian states or authoritarian states, how elites are very important in policy implementation. So to what extent are they important in preventing, for example, social, demo so social reforms or democrat democratization generally? Could you just say who you are as well? Just I'm, here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a master's student. Ah. Oh. Poland, I think I already told you, I'm terrible in predicting re election results. I didn't predict Trump. I didn't predict Bolsonaro. I didn't predict Bush. I think my political sentiments override reason at that moment or something. So, uh, yeah, Poland is just an unpleasant country in which things you may not know have recently really heated up because the government is trying to stay in power by any means. And that means that they passed legislation which is going to call for some special commissions which will be able to investigate people for their contact with Russia and take political rights away from them. Nothing is defined the prerogative procedures, nothing. So it's really kind of an attempted coup d'etat. And if you may not know, there are 500,000 people on the streets of Warsaw for the first time since 1989. So it's a country to watch, that's all I can say, because it's going to be heated, and the elections October and November, yes, something like this. Um, elites. So, you know, elites. Yeah, so there are all kinds of sectors of different industries which organize uh, to influence policy of the government. Um, I, for example, you know, 
in Brazil for a long time, you could not increase taxes unless the tax increase was approved by the Chamber of Commons of Commerce of the state of Sao Paulo. And it was just de facto. I know it, one of my closest friends was a minister of finance who went there with a tax reform proposal. They turned it down and he was fired as a minister. Okay. So <laughs> it's just there. And sort of it's no, no longer true, by the way. I, I think that's true until about 10 years ago. Uh, but they had this power. No. Different groups of industry organized typically, exercise their powers through all kinds of channels. Political financing, electoral financing, and lobbying. Yeah. One of the big issues that Abi was mentioning uh, yesterday was, uh, yes, there was a European proposal to make uh, all kinds of firms fiduciaries of in ecological interests. That is, yes, to introduce into the statutes of private companies concern for environmental effect. That was in the draft of European legislation and the last moment was removed. They have to inform about what they think about their consequences of their policies, but they don't have to guard environmental interests. Why was it removed? Because of lobbying. So yes, the resistance is there all the time. Yes. Um, But, okay, as you say, there's something interesting about elites recently. Just read a French book. Traditional elites in France, I don't know what the, what's happening here. Traditionally in France, yes, elite adopted some culture of norms or patterns and they spread kind of down the social structure. It seems now that a lot of patterns are not initiated by elites. For example, names of children. There are all kinds of names of children in France which start with a K, like Kevin, Kevin. And that, no Parisian elite is called Kevin. That's in kind of your know, petite bourgeoisie in the provinces. The same with tattoos. Yes. Again, no Parisian elite would wear tattoos. That's okay. So what's happened to these cultural patterns may be significant. There may be something there. But anyway, that's just an aside. <laughs> well, it's a very good aside. Um, so let me just take a couple more questions. So first of all, um, Adrian, and then if you could just bring the microphone to the gentleman with the jacket. <clears throat> I should say I know that we have some people who are high school students in the audience, so don't hesitate to ask if you feel so disposed. Thanks for a very is it on? Yeah. Uh, thanks for a very interesting uh, and uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, speech. Uh, I, I would like, as a labor historian, that I'm, I'm from Switzerland and still uh, uh, not any longer that active member of the Social Democratic Party of Switzerland as I used to be. Uh, I would like to come back to the to the your short. Uh, uh, um, phrase where we thought that the, the long-term perspective, the basic program, so to speak, uh, doesn't play any longer any role. And I would uh, like to challenge this a little bit uh, uh, because I think I, I was myself involved in very marginally in drafting up a, a new uh, basic program of the SPS and uh, it is not that surprising what it is, is in there. It is, it is uh, uh, still uh, democratization of the whole of the society and uh, economic democracy in particular. And I really have the impression that there is something, and if, if I read your, your famous books, this was a time when this was still on the agenda or, or people thought it was on the agenda. And I uh, uh, can't really help the impression that the, the, the fact that social democracy seems 
to be on the defensive everywhere has to do with Seems that. to to be on the defensive everywhere has to to be with the fact that these basic programs are either no longer written or they are uh, really even less important than they used to be once but i think they they had a function to give a, a perspective to the to, to workers and to the to, to the interactions, even though they weren't directly present, and and perhaps uh, if you speak of uh, the electoral uh, the, the ecological challenges and so on, they, this could be also a way to 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 really say you need to to uh, direct investments. Uh, in a in a in a democratic way, and I think up to a certain degree, the what was happening in the United States and also here uh, with young people joining uh, social democratic parties, or uh, they, I, I have the impression they are rather looking for that than for uh, for for purely electoral politics. But I may may be wrong. If that's true, I I, st I stand corrected. I mean, I. I, I I know some parties and read materials of some parties. Um, oh, I think it's important. I just don't know whether it's feasible. That is, uh, you know, parties have to win elections. And whether some kind of a vision that is implementable by particular measures that goes beyond the immediate problems, that goes beyond pri à la pompe, whether that's feasible, that, that's my doubt. I'm, uh, look, you know, there were quite a few ideas we had, social democrats had at various times, yes. Uh, Co-management, workers' funds, uh, regional policies. Uh, they kind of, well, they failed or they vanished. Um, every time we think social democracy is in crisis, there is a little outburst of writings on market socialism, I don't know whether you remember that, yes. Uh, when I was a member of Analytical Marxists, we were very much working on models of market socialism. Yes. What are the alternative forms of property and decision-making within the firms that would uh, reduce inequalities produced by markets, increase employment, security and increase worker satisfactions. But I don't think I've seen an article on market socialism in several years again. So somehow, well, you have, you know, Philippe von Paris and universal income, that's implemented in some countries actually. Uh, but I just don't, you know, I don't see it, you see it. Okay, look, I'm just conscious of the fact that we're getting close to the end and there were a few people, so if, if just people could make sort of incredibly short questions and if you could just... Incredibly sort of, short answers. You know, incredibly <laughs> short answers, yeah. So um, sort of five words for the question and three words for the answer. Um, now we won't be able to get through everyone, but um, could we just... Um, uh, this, this gentleman here has been waiting for some time with a checked shirt. But just really keep it short, because otherwise we get... OK. Uh, yeah. My name is Pete Hall. Uh, I've just walked in off the street. I'm not even a high school student. I left at school at uh, 15. Now that's five words, so you've been, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I've got two ideas going through my mind. I was trying to remember the animal in a zoo in America that made better predictions or more accurate predictions of, I can't remember what, whether it was baseball games or elections or whatever. But something you said that I do remember uh, when you said, everything matters a little bit, but nothing matters very much. And yeah, I go along with that. But can you put those two 
things together, please. Okay, and only in three words. So um, uh, the, the fellow with the jacket at the back and the tie. And please just say quickly who you are and where you're from. Uh, I'm Aaron Gazal from London Academy of Excellence, Tottenham. And my question is, do you think social democracy can make a comeback because of the evolving politics on the left? For example, more people move, moving towards socialism seen in the 2017 general election or the election in Germany with the SDP in power or the uh, Scotland uh, SNP having a coalition with the Greens? Okay, so about the UK and the recent elections. And um, yes, uh, over here. Hello, Professor Shawarski. Uh, my question is very brief. What should a social democratic foreign policy be like? <laughs> <laughs> and <it's> okay, <laughs> five minutes. Last question. I don't know. <laughs> I... Prediction. I would have to go a little bit technical for some people, but look, what happens is that when we do this kind of studies, we decide whether something matters or not by statistical criteria. But we don't really think in terms of magnitudes. So I'll just give you a okay. So there is a famous study of 15 European countries and many regions about the impact of deindustrialization on the right-wing voting. And it's a famous study, and the results showing that regions that deindustrialize are more likely to vote to the right are, we, we say, statistically significant. What does it mean? It means that if you take the top 25% of regions which deindustrialize most and the bottom 25% that deindustrialize less, the difference in the rate of voting for the right is one half of 1%, which means that you know, if FDP in Germany got 12.3% of the vote, that's the difference between 12.1 and 12.5. It's nothing. Yes? That's the world in which we live. In which sort of everything is, is, we call it significant, but it doesn't add up to anything. If I ask you, so why does it happen? You'll say, oh, it's for one of 17 possible reasons. So, okay. uh, can social democrats win the election? Sure they can. I mean, I have no idea what's gonna happen. I was trying to argue, I was trying to show you that with more than two parties in multidimensional space, we cannot make predictions. We don't know how to. So we do it a little bit by what happened yesterday, a little bit by nose, and sometimes we do pretty well. But the general question is unanswerable. It depends what one party does in response to what the other party does. It depends whether voters are gonna change their mind when they see programs, or they will not change their mind with the C programs, we can't tell. We can tell how do people vote today, but we cannot say putatively how would they have voted if uh, all kinds of changes occur. Okay, listen, thank you very much. I mean, that's incredibly wide-ranging talk. You started by saying um, it was not an inspiring talk. But it was certainly an illuminating talk. And, I mean, you, you, you talked about the severe decline in the electoral fortunes of this tradition of parties, the enduring significance of some of their policy options, welfare states in particular, and went on to consider the sort of ideological disorientation, as you put it, moving from dreamers to firefighters. I think perhaps your self-denying ordinance on um, being inspiring, uh, you sort of a bit in spite of yourself turned to the end to consider the world through the eyes of your granddaughter and ended up, if I read you right, calling for courage, ideological courage, and for the growth of movements that might force things forward.